Here is something that you may or may not know about me. Besides being a debonair investigative journalist and anthropologist, I also happen to be married to one of the world's preeminent experts on all things Sasquatch. So, my name is Laura Krantz. I am a journalist. I worked for NPR for about 10 years, both in DC and Los Angeles. That's her. And the reason I'm having her on the show is because Laura just finished the third season of her podcast, Wild Thing, where she reports on one baffling subject after another that most people simply deride as nonsense. Instead of simply writing off a topic as too outlandish or just plain weird, she dives in head first and puts together a narrative nonfiction journey that weighs the topic from as scientific a lens as possible. It's also been incredibly popular, with almost 5 million downloads Loads, as well as a spin-off children's podcast series, and in October, a series of middle grade nonfiction illustrated kids books from Abrams Kids. So, you know, she's kind of a big deal. However, since saying that makes her look like the respectable journalist that she is, I, as her husband, have a habit of introducing her as simply an expert on all things Sasquatch. She doesn't always appreciate the implication. I wanted to know how you became such a Bigfoot expert. Um, I would say that I I do not consider myself a Bigfoot expert, um, although maybe other people possibly might. But in 2006, when I was living and working in Washington, D.C., there was an article in the Washington Post about this guy named Grover Krantz. Same last name. Note that. And he was a very preeminent anthropologist. And then there's this little throwaway paragraph at the end of the article that says he used to drive around the Pacific Northwest with a spotlight and a rifle searching for Sasquatch. And I was like, whoa, what a weirdo. Um, also, could we be related? Because he was from Salt Lake City, which is where my dad's family was from. And after a little investigative journalism, uh, which involved asking my father, uh, we found out that he was, in fact, my grandfather's cousin. And so I am indeed related to Bigfoot royalty because he is the country's or was the country's preeminent academic expert on Bigfoot and is considered one of the four horsemen of Sasquatchery. That's right. Sasquatchery. Before we go any further, I think it's important to mention that there's a link to Wild Thing down there in the doobly do. In fact, why don't you just go down there and subscribe right now? Because what she does in audio is a million times better than what I can do on my own video channel. And if you need a little time to sort out the subscription feed, no worries. I can wait. Laura first heard about her relationship to Bigfoot royalty all the way back at the beginning of this millennium, but it took her quite a long time to quit her day job and commit to Bigfoot full time. In fact, she needed a little bit of a nudge. So after much urging from your- uh, 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 Handsome for, and debonair husband. That's right, you're from your <laughs> handsome and debonair uh, husband. You eventually decided to, um, you know, spe dedicate a good chunk of your life to <laughs> looking for Bigfoot. And I guess all of that nudging backfired just a little bit because making a big show about Bigfoot is a great way to make people look at you weird for the rest of your life. And now I'm out in the woods looking for Bigfoot and I can't take myself seriously, let alone expect other people to take me seriously. I will never get a job again. So, sure, maybe I did participate in ruining her career, but there's a larger purpose here. Because in case you haven't noticed, the TV and the internet are chock full of stories about ancient aliens building the pyramids, visitations from other dimensions, and if you were to believe all of it, there would be cryptids around every single corner. If you ask me, those ways of storytelling turn what could have been interesting science into worthless conspiracy theories. So while the Wild Thing podcast won't land on the cover of the Inquirer or the History Channel, it finds a way to stay curious and grounded at the same time that it explores really interesting topics. I kind of wanted to find that line where we have these imaginative and potentially real things 
that come up against, you know, the hard realities of science. And, you know, I think you can hold on to the beliefs in those things, but you also have to temper that. And I think that is the difference between me and say ancient aliens, where they're like, nothing could have done this except for aliens. Um, but in fact, humans did do a lot of it. Well, and that's a skill that we're missing in society now anyway, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, one of the awesomest things about Wild Thing is that for me, it, it, it looks at that gray area. You're like, well, mm -hmm. science can't say this doesn't exist, but I don't know. Let's say we use the tool of science to see where it could fit in if it does. And that's what Wild Thing, I think, does so beautifully. Yeah, uh, it, it allows people to play around with these ideas rather than giving them a hard and fast no or yeah, absolutely, 100% they exist. It's like, because a lot of what we we do in the world is exist in this gray area where we don't have answers. We might not ever have answers. And sometimes even if we do have answers, it's fun to be able to imagine and pretend and think creatively. And I don't want to take that away from people. The reason that there is a gray area at all is because at least to some degree, there is a signal in all of that conspiracy noise. In fact, at one point when Laura traveled up into the wilderness of Washington, she came across something really strange. She went hiking with a local squatcher who showed her about a dozen enormous nests that some people believe could have been made by enormous primates. In the Pacific Northwest, uh, they look like giant bird's nests. Yeah, when you saw them, did you feel like, ah, bullshit, this must be some artist or basket weaver um, uh, who made this or what did you feel when you saw him? I was pretty surprised. I actually kind of expected to be like, eh, artist, basket weaver, pile of sticks, not all that impressive. And instead I was like, oh shit, this looks very real and very plausible. And what the hell built them? Just maybe all of these nests she came across were made by some unknown gorilla-like creature that no one had yet been able to document. Of course, like anyone who hears a story like this for the first time, it sounds like a tall tale, some completely made up fabrication. However, what you might not realize is that back in the 1800s, people talked about gorillas the same way they talk about Bigfoot today. So 1830s, there's a guy named Paul Duchayou who was a French explorer who was out in the jungles of Africa trying to find the, the evidence of this creature that you know, the, the native and indigenous populations had been talking about for a long time. There had been myths about since the ancient Greeks, um, but nobody in polite society believed that it actually exists. And in fact, if you did say that the gorilla existed, you were kind of laughed out of like the Royal Society of London and scientists looked down their nose at you and were all snooty about it. Paul Duchayou manages to find one with the help of local guides and shoots it and kills it and brings it back to London. And everyone's like, oh shit, it is real. And you have this myth, this thing that existed, this big joke that all of a sudden is a very real existing creature. And that kind of changes the perception of you know all those people for all the years who've been saying that it was silly. So this gives a lot of hope to the Bigfoot people as well. Right, so no one found gorillas until the 1800s. And so maybe Bigfoot is just the North American version, which has somehow escaped our notice all of these years. But let's ask the question that we have all been thinking. Is Bigfoot real? You have to listen to the podcast. I'm not telling you the answer to that. And how do you do that, you ask? by clicking on the link to the Wild Thing podcast right down there below this video. You didn't really think that she was going to spoil the whole affair, did you? The first season on Wild Thing explores all things Bigfoot, but there are still two more seasons of the show to talk about. Season two begins with the story of an interstellar object called a Muamua that cruised through our solar system a few years ago. But instead of just saying that it was a comet or an errant asteroid, the chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University, a guy named Avi Loeb, speculated that it could be an alien spaceship. You know, we definitely do not have evidence that it is aliens, but we also can't throw the idea out entirely. And I think Avi Loeb's bigger point was that 
you know, we're willing to accept a lot of other kind of crazy ideas about science. So why can't we accept the possibility that there might be alien life out there and that alien life might be sophisticated enough and technologically advanced enough to come pay us a visit? Um, it's not likely that a Muamua, which was the name of this, the name we gave this first interstellar object that we've ever seen, this was back in 2018, it's not likely that that was an alien light sail or alien technology, but it's also not impossible. And the idea is to be open minded about these things without your brains falling out, as the saying goes, and think about the different possibilities and see where those possibilities take you and what kind of ideas that might help you come up with and creativity that might spark and conversations that might come out of it. The second season covers a lot of ground. You could think of it as a crash course in all things extraterrestrial intelligence, from the stories about weird tic-tac-like aircraft buzzing naval jets on both the east and west coasts, to the original intent of the Voyager probes, and of course, the mysterious events at Roswell where some people believe that a flying saucer crash landed and it was covered up by the military. But my favorite part of the season actually has to do with how we would go about translating alien languages if our big telescopes over at SETI happened to pick up their radio signals. So SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And there's also a whole section of NASA. SETI is separate from NASA. They lost funding. They've been cut out of the budget, although lately they're getting a little bit more and more of it. So they're kind of being let back into the room again. Um, but they are specifically looking for intelligent life that could communicate with humanity. The problem, of course, is we don't know what that communication would look like. We don't even have the slightest idea if there's life out there, let alone how advanced it is, let alone how it would communicate. I mean, it might use like smells and we would be completely effed because our sense of smell is actually not that good, except for mine. Mine's really good. Um, and with that in mind, how we have a perfect opportunity here on Earth to think about communication because there are all these species of animals around us that actually are communicating at a level that is fairly sophisticated. And we can use this opportunity to try and figure out what they're saying and figure out how to communicate with them. And the off chance that the aliens ever do reach out to us, we might have a better idea of how to do actual communication. So there is a guy named Lawrence Doyle who is with SETI and he's an astrobiologist, but he also has been playing around with languages. And there is an old sort of uh, equation or formula for understanding language that is called Zipf's Law, Z-I-P-F, apostrophe S. It is a little bit of a mouthful, but essentially it looks at human language and it's able to put a mathematical formula to it. And what this guy found out, this uh, Lawrence Doyle, is that if you apply that same mathematical formula to dolphin squeaks <laughs> and whale noises, they fall, they're charted the same. They chart the same path. So that shows you that there is a sophisticated language going on there in communication. We just don't have any idea what they're saying. So that seems like a really good opportunity to try and figure out how they're communicating. And then, you know, we're practicing a little bit for when our alien overlords arrive. In the third season of Wild Thing, Laura goes back to her hometown of Idaho Falls, Idaho, to cover what feels like a more serious subject, the forgotten true story of the deadliest nuclear accident in American history, and what that means for the future of nuclear energy in America. Clearly, she's trying to claw back some non-Bigfoot-related integrity. Tell me about that. So it was actually outside of Idaho Falls, which is a booming metropolis, and I did ride a wild potato to school. Um, it's harder than it looks. There's not really a lot to grab onto. It looks uh, hard. It is hard. It's very <laughs> hard. So outside of Idaho Falls, there is something called the Idaho National Laboratory, which was established back in the, the late 1940s, sort of in the... Uh, after World War II. And initially it was established as the National Reactor Testing Station. So this is after World War II. We've just seen what can happen with the atomic bomb. And now we're like, okay, let's see if we can use nuclear energy for good. We're gonna build all these different kinds of nuclear reactors with all different kinds of materials and fuels, and we're gonna test them and we're gonna blow them up on purpose. And sometimes we're gonna blow them up on accident, whoops. And then in 1961, the army, which was testing out a very small 
uh, reactor, which it was planning to use in the Arctic Circle as a sort of watch post and a, a way uh, it, they would have been able to power a small base up there. Um, it blew up. January 3rd, 1961, and it killed three men. It is still the deadliest nuclear reactor accident in American history. Um, I grew up in Idaho Falls, and I didn't learn about this until, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago at the earliest. So it's crazy to me that this is such a pivotal moment in nuclear history, and people don't really know about it. You ask, and most people think Three Mile Island, where nobody actually was killed and the release of any kinds of radionuclides was fairly small. So that captured my attention. And then you add to that 60 years later, Idaho Falls, which has never been on the receiving end of any of the nuclear power that is generated at the lab, is now about to get some of nuclear energy from these brand new nuclear reactors that are being developed in the hopes of dealing with climate change. So I thought that was kind of a nice set of bookends to sort of look at nuclear mm -hmm. energy. How far have we come? Sure, technologically we're way better, but are we as humans vastly improved? Normally journalists have some idea how they're gonna come down on an issue once they start digging into it. But one of Lara's most admirable qualities is her ability to keep an open mind about topics that everyone else seems to have closed ones on. And it isn't just a narrative device in the podcast. I really did watch her go back and forth for years trying to decide whether America should go all nuclear or abandon the effort altogether. When we first started, you were actually pretty pro-nuclear, as I recall. And then you quickly went over to the other side being like, no, nuclear is going to kill us. And then a month or two after that, nuclear is the best. And, you know, <laughs> your, your, your perseveration on this, um, you know, not only in your life, but also in, um, you know, in the show itself is, um, you know, helps, I think, the, the listener make up their own mind because you clearly have not made up yours. But where do you fall at this particular moment? Answer I don't have a yes or no answer. I mean, I think this goes back to the point of what is the podcast about. I don't know that there are clear answers for this because it kind of depends on how comfortable you are with the risks. And it depends on what you think the future looks like in terms of energy. And there are there's just a lot of gray area here too that I think people need to be somewhat comfortable dwelling in. And in terms of nuclear, I think there's been a lot of black and white, like it's either good or bad. And that like aliens, like Bigfoot, not the case. Of course, I'm biased about Laura's show. You might think that my own personal recommendation about Wild Thing is a lot like asking a mom if they think their child did well in the school play. Yes, honey, you did great. But the only way that you're gonna know for sure is if you listen for yourself. That said, I did want to ask her what motivates her to keep diving into all of these new seasons as she plans her next one. The question here is what keeps you so curious? Uh, lots of drugs. I think we're <laughs> gonna end it right there. That's no. <laughs> just end out. Okay, and take two. The most surprising thing is that they kind of come from all over. It's men and women. It is people from the left and people from the right. It is um, parents doing, you know, having their kids listen to this, which I totally did not expect. And as a result, now Wild Thing is going to be a series of nonfiction middle grade books, which is awesome. Um, it was teachers doing this in classrooms. I've had letters from all over the world and from people who are actually experts on the subject matter who are like, this is great. You've made this so appealing to sort of a general audience without making it silly. And to me, the, the wide appeal of it is actually what ended up being most surprising. So there you have it. Go listen to Wild Thing right now and tell me what you think. But before we go, I had just one more question for Laura. I do have uh, a final request is that, I don't know, like, Whenever we're in town together again, I'd love to hang out and get you a drink or a <laughs> cup of coffee, maybe like a kombucha. I don't know what you're into, um, but I think, I mean, we should really try to make that happen because you seem really cool. I like ice cream. Can we go get an ice cream? We can absolutely get you okay. an ice cream. Yeah. That sounds good. Mint chocolate chip, please. You can find Wild Thing on every podcast platform out there, as well as in the details down below. If you liked this show and want to see more like it, you're in luck. 
I put out new episodes every week or so. So don't forget to like and subscribe or even sign up for my newsletter so that you never miss an episode. And also give some thanks to Ron. Can you introduce me as Joker? As he is dealing with a lot of crazy edits here. And Ron is my video editor and we love him. Thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Krantz and I'm super excited to announce my new book, The Search for Sasquatch. It has all these amazing illustrations in it and it is all about how I go out into the woods looking for Bigfoot and trying to figure out if he or she or they are actually real. The book is out as of October 11th, 2022. Look for it in all bookstores and on Amazon.